Howdy, it's me again. I figured it was time to stop picking on all those poor presidential hopefuls and get back to economics. And today I'm going to take on a very poorly understood phenomenon, inflation. Now it's a little complicated, so I'm going to need to do it in two parts. First, in this video, I'm going to cover what does not cause inflation, despite conventional wisdom to the contrary. In a second future video, which I ain't done writ yet, I will explain what actually does cause inflation and what its real impact is. So, part one, and I'm going to call this episode, Printing Money Does Not Cause Inflation. Now, probably right now you're thinking, well, no way, that's got to be true. I mean, that was on one of the tablets brought down from Mount Sinai by Moses. Well, A, no, it wasn't. And B, I believe that by the end of this video, you'll have more than a few questions about the actual godliness of that old commandment. Now, if we're going to pick on this view, let's start at the top with an article I had to read in grad school because it was considered a classic. Milton Friedman's The Optimum Quantity of Money. Now, in setting up his model, Friedman makes the following assumptions, some implicitly, some explicitly. First, the economy is already at full employment. We are producing as much as we can possibly produce with given labor, capital, resources, and so on. Second, people like to hold some volume of cash in their savings for convenience and safety, and they are already holding that amount. Third, the supply of cash is under the complete control of some external authority. And there's, there's more assumptions and premises and so forth, but that's all we need for today. Now, let's say everything's going along just fine, and suddenly a helicopter shows up. And this is a quote from the original paper. Let us suppose that one day a heliocopter flies over this community and drops an additional $1,000 in bills from the sky, which is, of course, hastily collected by the members of the community. Now, recall Friedman's assumption that people are already holding as much cash as they want to hold. That means that when this new supply of money comes in, it is in excess of the community's demand for money. That, by the way, is a key monitor's proposition. The idea that inflation results when the supply of money exceeds the demand for money. And we're going back to our story. Those people who have the excess cash will now try to get rid of it by spending it. But we already assumed we was at full employment. So there's nothing else to buy. We are producing a max capacity by assumption. Again, quoting from the article, people's attempts to spend more than they receive will be frustrated, but in the process of these attempts will bid up the value of services. In other words, people will try to buy more, but there isn't any more, so they just bid up prices. And voila, just like that, printing money and, and then dropping it from a helicopter causes inflation. Friedman then goes on to argue that because over time output would rise in this community, as technology went up and so on, uh, the money supply should be set to rise at right around that same rate, called a money growth rule. That's great stuff, huh? Except he commits at least three errors. I'm going to go over three of them here today. We can probably find more than that, but we'll just do three. First thing he does wrong, well, he's assuming full employment. Now, note that not only are we rarely at full employment, but if we aren't, then there's no guarantee that increased spending drives up prices. It could instead lead firms to produce more output. And drawing on a historical example, I don't know if you remember all the fear-mongering after the financial crisis. Blog after blog was arguing that hyperinflation was resulting, going to be resulting from the extremely stimulative monetary policy of the Fed, all that quantitative easing and so forth. Well, we didn't get hyperinflation, did we? Far from it. What we did witness was a decline in unemployment from 10% to below 4%. Now, I'm not saying that was the direct result of the monetary policy, mind you. I'm just making the point that if you are setting out to analyze the impact of policy choices on an economy, assuming full employment from the outset is a rather questionable choice. Hey, I got an idea. Let's analyze the impact of penicillin, starting with the assumption that the patient's already healthy. Second. You remember the part about the helicopter drop causing people to have more cash than they desired? That's a situation in which the supply of money exceeds the demand for money, and that's impossible in the real world. Think about how monetary policy actually works and how the Fed increases the money supply. Every mechanism at their disposal requires the conscious, voluntary cooperation of a private sector agent. Uh, for example, what if the Fed uh, uses their open market operations to buy a treasury bill from you for $100. This has increased the supply of money by $100. 
However, the Fed cannot force you to do that. You must freely choose to sell the Treasury bill or the Fed is powerless to increase the money supply. In that sense, the money supply is like a haircut. You cannot supply haircuts in the absence of a simultaneous demand for haircuts. There could never be an excess supply of haircuts. There could be an excess supply of donuts because you can make a donut even if nobody wants one. But that's not true with haircuts or money. Private sector agents must willingly choose to add the new money to their portfolio of assets or it stays at the vault in the Fed. Now there are other mechanisms available to the Fed, but those too require voluntary cooperation. Generally speaking, these involve making it easier for private banks to loan out money. Um, when private banks make loans, that actually creates new money as well. But again, somebody has to choose to take out the loan. You can't force loans on people. Any way you look at it, it is impossible for the Federal Reserve to increase the money supply beyond the private sector's demand for it. Ergo, that's, that's Latin, ergo, Friedman's helicopter did something that a real central bank can't do. As a matter of fact, and here is the third and final nail in the coffin we're going to cover today, Friedman's helicopter isn't even engaging in monetary policy. It's actually undertaking fiscal policy. This is so because Friedman's helicopter raised people's incomes. That's what happens when the government cuts taxes or increases spending. Well, that's fiscal policy. And that's not what happens when the Fed increases the money supply. Monetary policy trades one asset for another, leaving total wealth and income the same. In my example above, where the Fed bought your treasury bill for $100, you ended no richer than when you started. You just have cash now instead of a treasury bill. Monetary policy cannot make you richer. It can only change the composition of the portfolio of your assets. If the helicopter had truly engaged in monetary policy, it would have needed a vacuum cleaner attached to it so that it could suck up an equivalent amount of people's financial assets once it dropped out the money. So the helicopter dropped out the $1,000, but then simultaneously vacuum up, say, $1,000 in treasury bills. That's how monetary policy works. And in that event, there's no guarantee people spend more money because they're not any wealthier than when they started. The helicopter drop no longer creates inflation once we force it to engage in monetary and not fiscal policy. And there you have it. Uh, honestly, it's not a very good paper, and yet we base policy on it. God help us. But if printing money doesn't cause inflation, what does? For that, you'll have to wait for video number two. Thank you.